I'm very pleased to have Seth Stevens Davidowitz here. He has used data from the internet, particularly Google searches, to get new insights into the human psyche. Today we'll be discussing his book and research, Everybody from Everybody Lies. Uh, Seth has used Google searches to uh, measure racism, self-induced abortion, depression, child abuse, hateful mobs, humor, sexual preference, anxiety, and sexual insecurity, among many other topics. Um, some a little less depressing than some of those, right? Um, Seth worked for one and a half years here uh, as a data scientist at Google, uh, so that's really exciting, and is currently a contributing op-ed writer for the New York Times. Uh, he's designing and teaching a course at the Wharton School, uh, where he, he will be a visiting lecturer. Uh, Seth received his BA in philosophy from Stanford and a PhD uh, from Harvard in economics. So please, let's give Seth a warm welcome. All right, thanks uh, everybody for attending. <laughs> Thank you, Megan, for the introduction. And uh, it's great to be back here. I did work for one and a half years in Mountain Dew, Google, uh, but I did come by here a while ago, and uh, I forgot how spectacular it is here. So uh, it's a nice reminder. But uh, it's, 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 it's nice to be here. I'm talking about my book, Everybody Lies, uh, which is how we can use data from the internet to understand who we really are. So for the last 80 years, if you want to know uh, what people want, uh, why people did the things they do, what people will do in the future, you had one main approach. You asked them, right? You conducted a survey. Uh, Gallup or Pew or Quinnipiac uh, would go around and say, uh, what, what, do you, what do you want? What are you going to do? And a main problem with this is that people have been shown to lie to surveys, uh, particularly on sensitive topics. They try to make themselves look good. They tell surveys what they think the surveyor wants to hear, not necessarily the truth. So a classic example of this is if you ask people before an election, are you going to vote in the election? A huge percentage, the overwhelming majority of Americans say, sure, of course, I'm going to exercise my civic duty and vote. <laughs> And then when the election comes around, about 55% of Americans vote. So people don't want to say that they're not voting. Uh, one of my favorite examples is the General Social Survey asks Americans how frequently they have sex uh, and how frequently they use a condom. So according to women, they have sex about, on average about once a week uh, and use a condom 20% of the time. Uh, so they say that they're using 1.1 billion condoms every year. And then they also must say whether it's gay or straight. So they're using 1.1 billion condoms every year in heterosexual sexual encounters. And then they ask men the same questions. And according to men, they're using 1.6 billion condoms every year uh, in heterosexual sexual encounters. Uh, I hope everyone realizes those, by definition, have to be the same, right? So uh, we already know that someone's lying. Someone's not telling the truth here uh, about how much sex they're having. And uh, I got data from Nielsen. They track every condom sold in the United States. Only 600 million condoms are sold every year. <laughs> So basically now everybody's lying about sex. Uh, just men are lying even more than women. Uh, and this doesn't mean, this could just be they're lying about using a condom, not necessarily how much sex they have. But if you see how much unprotected sex women of fertility age say they're having, if they really were having this much sex, there would basically be more pregnancies every year in the United States. So uh, I think in our sex-obsessed culture, there's now a pressure both on men and women uh, to say they're having more sex than they actually are having. All right. Digital truth serum. Google, the thesis of my book, basically the thesis of my research for the last five years, is that people are much more honest on Google uh, than they are to basically any other source, I think. Uh, people tend to feel comfortable uh, typing things into Google uh, that they might not tell uh, anybody else. And uh, this data, of course, is all anonymous and aggregate, so nobody knows uh, the searches that any particular person makes. But by aggregating it all and, and putting it all together, we can see different patterns uh, in human behavior uh, and human uh, wants. So like example, people are on it, do tell things Google they might not tell anyone else. There are more searches on average. Uh, this is using Google Trends for porn than for weather. Though if you ask people uh, if they watch porn, only about 20% of men and 4% of women say they watch porn. So that's hard to reconcile. But people are clearly typing things into Google that they might not be comfortable telling to a survey. Uh, so we can learn really uh, lots of, uh, uh, so, so why are people so honest on Google? Well, one thing, they're alone, uh, they're online. That tends to make people more honest. 
but they also have an incentive to tell the truth to Google. So you, there's no reason for any person to tell a, sur to tell a survey that they're uh, voting about their voting behavior, whether they're actually voting or not voting. Uh, there's no reason to, tell, to, to be honest about that. But if you're someone who doesn't always vote or is kind of a marginal voter, you may not know where the polling places are. So you have to tell Google, you have to say where to vote or how to vote or search something like that. And it, it, it is clear in the data that uh, this predicts turnout in different parts of the country, that when people are making a lot of searches for where to vote and how to vote, uh, people are much more likely to turn out to vote. And if you're not having a lot of sex, you don't have a reason to tell that to a, a survey. There's no reason for you to do that. But you might have an, an incentive to search for this on Google. And the number one complaint about a marriage on Google by far is that it's a sexless marriage, uh, much more common than loveless or unhappy marriage. Uh, and we also start seeing in this data some things that are maybe counterintuitive or surprising. Uh, the number one complaint about a partner on Google for husband, wife, boyfriend, or girlfriend is that the partner won't have sex with me. Uh, it e easily beats the second place complaint that the partner won't text me back. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, 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 there, there are actually twice as many complaints on Google that my boyfriend won't have sex with me than that my girlfriend won't have sex with me which goes you know, completely against conventional wisdom about, uh, about uh, who's, avoiding, who's avoiding sex. Uh, so I think there are definitely surprising things in this data. We can also use this search data to answer big, big questions uh, that have kind of puzzled uh, researchers for a while. Uh, one of them uh, that I've done a lot of research on is on racism. So this is kind of a classic area where it may be difficult to find the truth by using surveys. And for example, after the 2008 election, uh, one of the big questions was, would voters, did voters care that Barack Obama, the first major party general election candidate who was African American, did they care that he was black? And if you ask in surveys, uh, the overwhelming majority of Americans, 98%, 99% of Americans, said, no, I didn't care at all that Obama was black. It was not a factor in my voting decision. Uh, but of course, uh, this may be misleading. Uh, because uh, people may lie and not want to admit that they cared that Obama was black. So what I did, uh, this is kind of the first study I did with this uh, research, is I studied racist searches that people make on Google. And uh, this is obviously disturbing. Uh, this is a, a, a search for a very, very uh, nasty uh, word about African Americans that you can kind of guess probably what it is, or look or read my book if, if you want to learn more. But uh, it's this is a basically dis people searching for disparaging jokes, mocking African Americans. Uh, so really, really uh, nasty searches. And the first thing that struck me out about these searches was how frequent they were. Uh, in the time period I was looking, uh, this search was about as common as searches for Lakers and Economist and Migraine and Daily Show. So not by any stretch of the imagination, a fringe search. And uh, the other thing that was striking about this uh, when I first saw this data is that the map looks very different than the map that I would have guessed. So if you had asked me before I did this research, where is racism highest in the United States, I would have said south, right? Deep south. Like that's, when you think of the country's history, you think Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama and South Carolina. And those areas definitely are among the highest. Uh, but also among the highest are West Virginia and Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio and upstate New York and parts of industrial Michigan and rural Illinois. Uh, the real divide this map reveals in racism to, to, uh, these days in the United States is not south versus north. It's east versus west. So it's, it's much higher. Racism is much higher east of the Mississippi River than west of the Mississippi River. So how can you use this map to uh, detect how much racism cost Obama? Basically, I compared Obama to previous Democratic candidates, such as John Kerry, the white candidate who was similarly liberal in the previous candidate in the previous election. And you see a very, very clear relationship that in parts of the country that are making the most racist searches in Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, and Western Michigan, you see a clear relationship that Obama just does worse than previous Democratic candidates did. And you try to explain it by any other, uh, any other variable you have, and nothing else can really explain this relationship. Uh, except, ra except racism. So I think it was really, really clear in this data that despite what people were saying, a, a significant fraction of Americans, I say about four percentage points overall he lost, and about 10% of Americans, uh, white Americans, would not support a Democratic candidate uh, just because he was black. I think that's, that's, that's what I picked up in this data. 
And then I kind of, uh, I kind of this, this kind of languished in academic journals for a while. People weren't really paying much attention to it. Uh, but then in this recent election, uh, Donald Trump uh, started saying some nasty things about, about black people, right? And was still getting a lot of support. And this was kind of puzzling to a lot of people who thought that uh, you're not really allowed to say those things uh, in the United States these days. Uh, so not me, but actually uh, Nate Cohn at the New York Times, uh, a stats guy there, uh, he asked for this data. He said, can I see your racist search data? I have data on how Trump is doing in the primary in all different parts of the country. And I want to see if it correlates uh, with your racist search data. And he found uh, that it was the single highest variable that he could find uh, that, uh, the, you know, for, that uh, it was higher than age and education and economic conditions and trade and uh, policy positions and gun ownership. Basically, nothing could explain uh, support for Trump in the primary to the same degree as this racist search uh, did. So I think uh, what happened is the same hidden racism that was hurting Obama but not being picked up in the data also helped carry uh, Trump uh, to victory. So I think, yeah, uh, this is the digital truth theorem. And uh, Megan is right. My book is, <laughs> is kind of depressing, I think, a little bit. <laughs> uh, because, yeah, like if you ask people what they're like, uh, they're going to give you a more positive uh, view of, of themselves than they, than they uh, necessarily uh, really are. So uh, yeah, I talk about racism, and I talk about child abuse, and do-it-yourself abortion. I think America has a do-it-yourself abortion crisis that isn't being picked up in the traditional data sources. So uh, really, yeah, dark, horrifying, terrifying, uh, disturbing material. Uh, but I put jokes in it, so uh, <laughs> you won't really notice uh, just how miserable uh, all the findings are. But uh, I think there actually, so I think there actually is uh, a lot of value to uh, knowing some of this stuff, to knowing the truth, uh, even if it is sometimes uh, depressing and sometimes disturbing. Uh, and I'll give you a couple examples of that. So one of the studies I did is I just compared uh, the searches that the Google searches that people make uh, about sons and daughters. And I would have thought or hoped uh, in the United States today that parents treated their sons and daughters the same way. Uh, but if you look at everybody's search data together, you see very, very different patterns where when American parents start a search, is my son, they're about twice as likely to complete it with gifted or a genius than if they start a search, is my daughter. And when they start a search, is my daughter, they're much more likely to complete it with, is my daughter overweight, or even is my daughter ugly? So uh, despite what I think parents uh, might think, uh, there's clearly, when you put together everybody's data, uh, parents on average are much more excited about the intellectual potential of their sons and much more concerned about the physical appearance of their daughters. And I think that's one finding. So you talk about the racism thing. It's not clear that the people who are making the, these racist searches, uh, if you just tell them, they're going to be like, oh, OK, I didn't realize I was racist. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to stop making these you know, uh, terrible searches, joke searches and stuff. But I think with this parenting finding, I think a lot of parents don't even realize that they're doing that. Uh, it's maybe a subconscious prejudice that they're not aware of. And if th that's one where maybe just the information itself can actually help to change behavior. Uh, where if we tell parents, oh, you know, you might not think so, but look, when we put together everybody's data, even it, you know, throughout the United States, there is this, uh, there are these prejudices. Like, think twice. Uh, are you are you paying enough attention to the report card that your daughter is bringing home? Uh, are are you paying enough attention to her intellectual interests? Uh, you know, I, I, I think a lot of parents have told me that that has made them think twice uh, about some of the questions they ask and some of the ways they treat their sons and daughters. So there is a lot of value in knowing things. Uh, knowing the truth, not what people think or what people say. Uh, and another example that I'm going to give uh, is about Islamophobia. So if you can go back to uh, the San Bernardino attacks in December 2015, if people remember that, it was two people with a Muslim-sounding name uh, shot up uh, basically one of the guy's coworkers. And uh, it was kind of a, a big, many, many people died. And it was a big news story. And right after this, there was an explosion of Islamophobia. And you saw that really, really clearly in the Google searches, where the number one search with the word Muslims in it immediately after the attack was kill Muslims. And these are people just kind of 
they're maniacs to some degree. These are kind of just not the most sane members of society. It's not even clear what exactly they're saying, but they're saying, uh, but they're they're very angry and kind of just want to uh, want to do something bad. And they also make searches like "I hate Muslims." Uh, or you know, Muslims must die, or really, really nasty, nasty, horrible uh, searches. And these searches we've shown can predict hate crimes uh, in the United in the United States against Muslims. So they're not, uh, even though they're weird, they definitely contain uh, meaningful information. So a few days after the San Bernardino attack, uh, Barack Obama gave a talk to the nation, and the theme of this talk was both that we had to protect ourselves against terrorism. But also, we had to fight this Islamophobia. We couldn't really allow uh, ourselves to give in to this hatred that some a small, a small uh, but dangerous percentage of people uh, were, were letting themselves uh, give in to. And uh, the speech was nationally televised. It got a lot of attention. And it was uh, one of the more beautiful speeches I'd heard Obama give. Uh, it was kind of classic Obama, but even better than classic Obama, where he talked about uh, how is our responsibility to not give in to fear and to appeal to freedom, and how it's our responsibility to not reject someone just because of the religion they practice. And uh, it got great reviews from all the serious sources. Right, The New York Times said it was a great speech, and the LA Times said it was a great speech, and uh, the Boston Globe said it was a great speech. Uh, so it was the, kind of all the conventional wisdom was that Obama had given this great speech. Uh, about the res our, our responsibility to treat our neighbors uh, uh, kindly, uh, our Muslim American neighbors kindly. So Google breaks down minute by minute their search data. And I wanted to see, did this beautiful speech uh, do it serve its purpose? Did it calm down uh, these Islamophobes? And I looked at the data. And I found that not only did these crazy searches kill Muslims, hate Muslims, I hate Muslims, die Muslims, they didn't uh, drop. They didn't even stay the same. They went way up. They exploded. Basically, every time Obama was saying, uh, you know, the, all these responsibility, the, 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 the importance of responsibility, and this beautiful sermon just seemed to backfire completely on, all the, by, uh, on, on its main purpose. But there was one line that Obama gave at the speech that seemed to have a different response. So he said that we had to remember that Muslim Americans are our friends and neighbors. Uh, there are athletes, and there are sports heroes, and they're the men and women who will die for this country. And right after he said that line, uh, for the first time in the last five years, the top word search with Muslims was not Muslim terrorists or Muslim refugees. It was Muslim athletes, followed by Muslim soldiers. So, and that, these stayed up for about a week afterwards. And you saw throughout the internet, people were talking about, Shaquille O'Neal's a Muslim? I didn't know Shaquille O'Neal was, was a Muslim. And I think that does, you can kind of compare most of the speech versus what that line was. So the first part, the, the, most of the speech uh, was basically a lecture telling people not everything they'd heard a million times before, nothing new, right? Lecturing them. That, that, to be better people than they, that, that, than they were. And that seemed to totally backfire. But the line about the athletes and sports heroes was provoking their curiosity, giving them new information, changing what they might think of as a Muslim American. And that seemed to be more successful. Uh, so we wrote this up in, uh, the New York Time, in a column in the New York Times. And I don't think uh, it's totally crazy that when you write a New York Times column, powerful people uh, see that. Because uh, a couple weeks later, Obama gave another speech. Uh, this time, it was in a Baltimore mosque. And again, it was on national TV. And again, it got a lot of attention. And the content of the speech was totally different. Uh, basically, he stopped with all the sermon, all the lectures, all the talk of responsibility. And he just doubled down or even quadrupled down on the curiosity. So he said that Muslim Americans are not just our uh, sports heroes and our soldiers. There are farmers and our merchants. And he talked about how Thomas Jefferson had a copy of the Quran and how Muslim Americans built the skyscrapers of Chicago. So it was all these new images of Muslim Americans that we didn't uh, previously have. And we look, I looked at the search data again uh, after this speech, in the, in the hours following this speech. 
And this time, the searches for kill Muslims and I hate Muslims dropped. So I think uh, that's only two speeches. And I don't want to say that, uh, that, that we've solved the problem of, of hatred. But I do think that this is a radically new tool. And I think people don't realize just how revolutionary this data from the internet is, that we can actually peer into an angry mob and turn that into a science, right? You can't, uh, in a survey of all Americans, you're not going to get uh, necessarily these, uh, you know, these, uh, these people. And even if you do, they may not be honest. And they're not going to agree to participate in a lab experiment at Princeton or Harvard. Uh, but because Google searches contains everybody's information, uh, they're going to be on there. And we can actually see uh, what, you know, how they respond to big national events uh, and maybe learn uh, you know, a lot of the things that we thought worked don't work, but here are things that actually work. So I think that kind of shows uh, that this window into some parts of the psyche that are disturbing uh, but are usually missed uh, can really serve a useful purpose where uh, knowing the truth is maybe the first step towards uh, improving the world, uh, I think. So uh, that's all I have to say. I'm going to now, uh, I think we're going to take questions from uh, Megan and, and other people about the book. All right. Hi, Seth. Hi, that was hi, great. Hi. The book's awesome. Um, it's really cool if you work at Google because you can see sort of what's going on here and uh, sort of a different variation of uh, what we do here every day. So I highly recommend it. Um, and th that was just a few of the topics that you cover. You cover so many topics in the book. But I thought I'd start uh, asking you a little bit about your experience working here and how that sort of led you to become a writer and if there's anything you miss about being here. Yeah, no, I, I, I didn't miss it until I just had like the food right before I got here. I'm like, oh, man, <laughs> what was I thinking? Like, uh, and the views of all, like, they, they have a new floor here in the New York office where you can see the river. And it's just like, oh, my. And like the, all the furniture is so comfortable. Uh, so yeah, and like, yeah, and the people are all really smart. So I definitely, uh, I, I, uh, you know, you don't appreciate, see, appreciate what, what's the song, Joni Mitchell song? You don't know what you got till it's gone. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that kind of happened a little with Google. Although I, I am, am enjoying the writing thing as well. But, uh, and what was it like when you were working here? And what were you working on? Can you give a little bit of color around? Yeah, so I was working uh, under Hal Varian, the chief economist at Google. He's the guy who initially hired me. And then uh, I was on his team and also in quantitative marketing uh, out, at, out in Mountain View. So uh, kind of like a lot of in-house data consulting, uh, but also some advertising effectiveness studies. Uh, and and, and, and also some research, because I think Google was kind of getting interested in all this information we have. That's kind of one of the original reasons that Hal hired me, uh, that, look like, that there is this powerful data and kind of how, how, how should we be using uh, this information. And that was sort of part of the inspiration for this book, yes? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, it's just the more I studied this data, the more I'm like, wow, this stuff is really important. And there is a lot of important information, so I kind of wanted to get that message out. Cool. So, so in talking about the information, sometimes you get an answer and you go, wow, that totally makes sense. And sometimes you get an answer that is sort of contrary to what you would think ha the data would predict. And so there's a lot of psychology involved in this. Can, can you talk a little bit about how often that sort of happens, that um, the answer is what you would expect? And how do you kind of come to your conclusions when you get an answer that's totally uh, different than what you, you thought it would be? Yeah, I think uh, frequently things, th things are just different than I expected. So I did, I've done a lot of research on anxiety. And I thought anxiety was highest in New York City, like because I'm from New Jersey, right? Like I'm, I'm from New Jersey, New, like right outside New York City. I'm like Jewish. It was always like, oh, you're like a neurotic Woody Allen type. I always thought I was a really anxious neurotic type and that that was like a normal, uh, that, and that, that, that like we were all way more anxious than everybody else. But then you see in the search data uh, that it's not true at all, that anxiety is highest in Kentucky and uh, you know, upstate Maine and rural areas way more than urban areas and uh, places with lower levels of education more than higher levels of education. Uh, so I don't, yeah, I think it's just, just over and over again, the data, I think we're, we're just basically blind to the world. I think a lot of times we think whatever's going on in our own head is much more general than it is. Uh, or we just like we jump to conclusions very very fast, uh, so that's why I think I think the data is usually different than I expect. I mean sometimes it's not like if you search where uh, where do people search for Lakers, it's like Los Angeles, <laughs> and you probably didn't need like 
OK, that makes sense. Uh, it's like I'm not going like, to uh, like, yeah, shock the world. Like, no, the Lakers are more popular in Minneapolis than Los Angeles. Like, that's not true. But, uh, so has that helped control your anxiety? Because you're like, wow, those people in Maine, they've got it like, way worse than I have it here. Yeah, no, I think it, it just, it's just like changed how I thought about things. I'm like, oh, wow, that's not, yeah, that, that, it's just even like, and then it's even like very particular types of anxiety, like anxiety about death. People make searches of anxiety about death. And I'm like, oh, that's like the Woody Allen neurotic, like intellectual thing. But it's not true. It's like there are more of these searches in Kentucky and Alabama and Louisiana. So it's, it's just kind of interesting. And I, I definitely do kind of go through the world differently than I did before. That's super interesting. So, so you ask a lot of questions. I mean, we just talked about you know how many Americans are really racist, who cheats on their taxes, does advertising work? But I'm sure there are a lot of things that got left out in the book. So can you talk a little bit about sort of how you go about choosing your topics and if there was anything interesting that maybe didn't make the cut? Because there's so many interesting sort of factoids. Yeah, uh, I, I don't really, there's not a science to to choosing a topic, you just kind of go around the world and talk to a lot of people and read a lot of things. And then one thing sparks a question, or you play around with data and it goes in a totally other direction. Uh, so I don't. So uh, so I think that didn't make it. I have like all this stuff in anxiety that's just not like ready for prime time that got cut. Like I could have had. I wanted to have like three chapters on anxiety because I just find it really really interesting. So that's like a whole other book that, that we can yeah, look forward yeah, to. Yeah, that's 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 that's, that's maybe my next book. Uh, but uh, but. Uh, yeah, like, there, so I've done this research on if you break down the minute by minute when people make searches for panic attacks. Uh, and it's not surprising. When do people make searches for panic attack? Like 2 AM, 3 AM, right? They're like in a cold sweat in the middle of the night. Uh, but like, what, what this basically means is that now, because this data, we know on every given night, we have a pretty good estimate of how many people are having panic attacks in New York City and Boston and Los Angeles and Indianapolis. And we can basically say, OK, why are on some nights a lot of people having panic attacks? Or like, is there something that happened three days before, or two days before, or the day before? So that, like, there's really just so much information here that uh, it's, yeah, I, th I think it's revolutionary. But some people criticize me for being too grandiose about, about no, it. I think that's great. You got to sell it, right? Yeah, like, um, yeah I, th I think the data is totally fascinating. I agree with you, and, and that it applies to so many things. Um, so th back to the election a little bit. You talked, you talked a little bit about that. And you kind of outsmarted Nate Silver. Would you say that that, that might be correct in, in some ways? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, are you Especially since I'm trying to get him to agree to let me write a column for his, <laughs> <laughs> for his site. Uh, are, you, uh, are you looking at data now? And what, what are you seeing in terms of trends in politics now that Trump is in office? Like, what's the follow-up to uh, what we heard you say about this sort of wave of populism and, and so yeah, forth? Yeah, so the thing about the election, so, so there's a question, just starting with politics, can you predict uh, elections with Google searches? Because if you locked at the survey, uh, surveys this year, they didn't really work so well, right? The surveys told us that Hillary Clinton was going to win, and then Donald Trump won. So is there a way to use all this information on the Google where people are so honest to predict elections? And it's not so simple. Uh, the top way most people have tried to do it initially was uh, you just see, are, you, are people searching for a candidate more? So if people are searching for Trump more, they're going to go Trump. And if people are searching for Clinton more, they're going to go Clinton. And you can probably think, like yourself, why that wouldn't really work, right? Because you're not saying whether you like the candidate or you hate the candidate. You could search for Trump because you like him or because you hate him. So one of the indicators uh, I found with Stuart Gabriel, who's a professor at UCLA, uh, we found there is an indicator that has surprising uh, predictive power. And it's the order in which people search candidates, which is pretty interesting. It's basically. Uh, if people, like 25% of the searches people make with Clinton also include the word Trump. So people search for Clinton-Trump polls or Clinton-Trump debate or Clinton-Trump election. But, the, but if people search Clinton before Trump, they're much more likely to go Clinton. And if they search Trump before Clinton, they're much more likely to go Trump. So it's like something subconscious. If you're a Trump supporter, you're much more think, likely to, to think of it as a Trump-Clinton election. If you're a Clinton supporter, you're much more likely to think the reverse. And then you could see that, uh, in general, uh, Trump came before Clinton more, and then th this was more true in uh, key Midwest battleground states, uh, which which he where he, he got he got victorious. But I think it's going to take many many more years of analyzing this data before we know exactly how to weight it and stuff. 
But there definitely is a lot of information in this data uh, that would be missed by other sources. So that'll give you something to do for a long time to come. Yeah, there's no shortage <laughs> of things to do with this data. Cool. I I'm going to invite uh, everyone here to start lining up at the mic if you have questions. So please come on up. Um, and in the meantime, I'll, I'll ask you one more question. Um, so some of the data gets personal, right? You talk about being a Mets fan or... Um, that's, or not, that's not embarrassing, is uh, it? No. <laughs> okay. just, just a little. Um, or, you know, like you talk about um, what women should do on a date to, like, get a second date. Um, so how much of this, like, came from sort of your own personal life and, uh, you know, is is that like a big way that you sort of select topics and and does that make you feel like more justified in in your everyday experiences uh no no I, I, a few a few of the topics were my personal interest a lot of the sports stuff uh, was my personal curiosity you wanted to be a baseball player yes basketball player, basketball player. but i would have settled for a baseball player <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah but i think uh i think but like the racism stuff i don't think i'm particularly racist or i did stuff <laughs> on gay there are a lot of closet gay men i'm not gay but i thought that was really interesting too okay uh so i don't know yeah it's not all uh it's, it's probably like 20 percent personal base but fair enough okay i'm gonna turn it over to you guys at the mic Hello. Okay. Um, so I was struck by something you said, which was that people are partially more honest online and with Google searches because they have an incentive. They're trying to get something from their search. Um, but then some of the searches that you cited with, you know, the racism research and some of the others, like I hate Muslims and, you know, things that didn't seem to be a question, which you would think is the incentive with a search. To what do you attribute that type of honesty? Because it sounds like those those people are not at the very least seeking additional information on a topic, which is our usual definition of a search. Yeah, that's a great question. That's uh, so yeah. So there there are two reasons that Google is honest. The one is the incentive thing. So if you're talking about a sexless marriage or racist jokes uh, or information on voting, uh, where they're sensitive topics, but you need the information. And then there's this other class of searches that totally shocked me. Uh, like it was one one of the most surprising things in the data, but. Uh, it happens in big numbers. People just confess things to Google. <laughs> so they say, I hate my boss, or like, I'm sad, or I'm drunk. And it's just like, OK, like, why are you, uh, why are you, uh, why are you telling Google? And it's, I, think it, I think a lot of it is, uh, I think a lot of it is, uh, it's kind of similar to the confessional, right? The Catholic confessional. Like, you don't, just something about, it, it, I think people treat it as like, like a confessional, you don't, there's no purpose to saying things, but there's something about saying things that you wouldn't tell anybody else. Uh, and it's, it, it's, people seem to use it in that way. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's really surprising. My favorite example is uh, that uh, one, I talk about how men are insecure about uh, their bodies. Men, so we usually think that women, uh, that, that like bodily insecurity is predominantly a female thing. And it is majority female, but if you look around the web, like it's, close, it's like 55, 45. Uh, women versus men, and men are really insecure about their bodies as well. Uh, and a lot of the, this insecurity, not surprisingly, focuses on one particular body part and the size of it in particular. <laughs> like men ask more questions about uh, their whatever than uh, <laughs> than, uh, than any other body part. But then one of their top questions they ask about this body part is how big is my penis? <laughs> Which is the strangest search ever, I don't right? understand. Yeah, yeah. So it's, the so it's the strangest search ever. So people make like the weirdest searches on Google. It's very bizarre. Follow up question, if, if I may. Um, have you done any sort of, or is there a data correlation analysis between, you know, for example, people confessing on various forums and Reddit and sort of places where you would confess, I think, with a, an expectation of other people like saying, oh, me too? Um, and like searches, like do they, they spike at the same time? Maybe or are they localized in the same way geographically? I haven't seen it. It's a good. It's a good question. I think the, some of the Google searches. I think that is it. That you kind of, if you type "I'm sad," you might get message boards where people are saying, "Oh, I'm sad too." Uh, so it might be that you're looking for people who are feeling the same way as you are, and just by saying it in that way, uh, you get that information. Thank you. Hi, thanks for coming today. 
So when I do a search, often I'll have one thing in mind, but as I'm typing the search, I'll see the autocomplete suggestion. Mm -hmm. And even though it's like not at all what I meant to search, I might, out of curiosity, complete that and just have that search anyway. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I'm wondering how you account for that, or how do you know that's trivial if a lot of people do that? Because you, know? you don't uh, want to count those, like double count, right? Well, it's, it's not clear you don't want to count them. I think it makes like, uh, I, I don't know what percent of searches. Somebody at Google probably knows what percent of searches are you use autocomplete. I don't know uh, that number. I don't think it's publicly available. But uh, I think uh, it makes small differences. It, it could like magnify small dif magnify initial differences, right? If people initially have to search something to get there, but then the winner will get potentially uh, more and more popular. So uh, I don't think it totally changes the level of things, like the ranking of things, but it can make a bigger difference between the top and the other ones. OK, so overall, you're saying that um, when you do look at the top search results, you do keep in mind to like scale down a little bit just to account for that. Yeah, and I think the regional ones are pretty, the regional differences are still pretty meaningful. Uh, since from my understanding, they don't, uh, they don't give, they don't on average give very different autocompletes. Yeah, cool, thank you. Uh, on your early chart that you had, the comparison with racism and correlation to Donald Trump, um, my question would be, what was that compared to Hillary? Because was that a flip or was it very similar in the two charts? Uh, so that was the primary voting. Yes. So it wasn't. So you're saying what happened in the general election? Yes. Yeah, I think the general election is a little more complicated because uh, it's like Democrats and Republicans differ differ in general. So it's not. So the most of the wet, the reason that one area goes Democrat and one area goes Republican is just it's more Democrat and Republican area in general. Uh, so you really want to compare it to previous elections. Uh, and that's also a little complicated because then Obama had this racism problem, and then Trump. I think what it's it's a little, it's basically that Trump, a a a, a not a, a a Republican candidate who didn't appeal to, uh, who didn't appeal to uh, racism in the way that I think Trump did, uh, would have uh, lost a lot of votes in part in places relative to Obama in parts of the country with a lot of racist searches, but Trump didn't lose those votes. So places like West Virginia and Western Pennsylvania and Eastern Ohio, if it was a norm, if it was a different Republican candidate, those areas they didn't like Obama, but they would have come, uh, but but they would have necessary, they would have maybe come back to a Democrat, but because Trump appealed to that same, uh, those same feelings that made them mad about Obama, they went Trump's way again. Okay, because the variation between the primary and the general election then probably has a great deal of effect. Uh, that. <laughs> that wouldn't have been in that, uh, the correlation between that, those two charts might have been quite different if they were done at the same time. Yeah, well, like I said, the general election is a little more complicated because uh, most of it is, mo the map of any particular general election is very similar year to year. Uh, there's just, so really, you just want to see the changes in behavior, the changes in votes in a general election. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, how's it going? Uh, quick question. You mentioned earlier how people, you know, lie on surveys, and we have the product Google Consumer Surveys. So I was wondering if there's any type of techniques or uh, things you've seen from data collection via surveys, like OKCupid okay, answer publicly versus answer privately. Have you seen anything that either yielded more consistent or reliable results uh, from a survey-based format? So there are. So online surveys tend to be better than phone surveys, for example, because I think talking to someone makes people that much more. Uh, dishonest. Uh, I think I, there are all these there are all these games that uh, uh, that scholars have invented to try to trick people into telling the truth, uh, and you can kind of look them up. It's it's random digit uh, random digit uh, examples or uh, I, I list list experiments. They basically ask people ten questions. Like one of them is is embarrassing and the other aren't, and ask how many is tr are true, yes or no. And then can kind of back out, for, and then ask another group that, except the embarrassing one, kind of can back out the difference if that makes sense. Uh, but my understanding is that these don't really work. Uh, although a lot of papers have been written about it, that, uh, that 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 they don't really work. I think Google Consumer Service has another pretty huge problem, uh, which is that people just answer randomly, uh, because uh, like at least if you're answering a phone survey, uh, you've gone through the time to uh, not not hang up right away. Uh, you you might give a you take it somewhat seriously, but I think uh, Google Consumer Surveys a big percentage of the people don't uh, 
don't give a serious answer. Yeah, so, or, or for the app, the screener questions, they always answer whatever they think that we want to screen in. Yeah, for. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then so, also, by the way, the 5K amplification study you worked on, the clients really liked it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that was another thing that I, I worked on. Yeah. Oh, OK. Hey, are you concerned at all about the Hawthorne effect by talking about what we can learn from the Google search results? Maybe people won't be as willing to put their dirty laundry out in Google. Yeah, I don't know if it's what we can learn. There definitely are changes in behavior. So this is all based on the idea that people will tell anything to Google. Uh, but someone did a paper where they compared uh, Google searches before and after uh, Snowden's leak. And they found that there was a big drop in searches that were either sensitive, so like uh, you know, on sensitive topics or embarrassing topics. Actually, my favorite thing from the paper is that they had a list of they uh, they had to figure out what's an embarrassing search. So they asked people, Mechanical Turk, like to rank the embarrassment of searches. And one of the, them that got classified as embarrassing uh, was Nickelback. <laughs> 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 and then they found that those types of searches did drop, including Nickelback <laughs> after, Snowden, uh, <laughs> after uh, Snowden's, uh, Snowden's revelation. So yeah, I, I don't think, yeah, it may be that uh, that this is a brief period of time where we can really see into the human psyche, and, uh, and then it'll all die down or something. I hope not. But uh, I think I always emphasize that like, everyone's like, have, has your search behavior changed since you've done this research? And it hasn't at all, because I'm like, like nobody knows my search. Like, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see why, why it should affect me if they know that someone in uh, Brooklyn is making a search or something. It doesn't seem like a... Although, if I was a racist, I might not want to give my state a bad name by doing lots of racist searches. I don't know if I felt bad about being racist. Maybe. Yeah, so it could be like, yeah, that, that's like kind of a subtle. Uh, I mean, that's definitely, that definitely would be, uh, I mean, a problem in polls as well. So, uh, but I don't know if that's, yeah. Thanks. Hi. Um, have you thought about comparing the Google search results with their like a, a, a social network results or posts? Um, are the social network results tend to be more or as honest as Google search terms or even more honest? Because people use that as a way to express themselves and not necessarily uh, uh, exposing, exposing their true identity or people still or Google search results tend to be more honest. No, I, I think no question Google search results are more are more honest uh, than social media. So I think that social media data uh, you can't really uh, trust because it's even in some sense worse than surveys because you have an incentive to make yourself look good uh, to impress your friends. Uh, so if you compare for example one, one, one example I talk about is the popularity of the National Enquirer versus the Atlantic Monthly. That uh, the National Enquirer actually sells, it's kind of a lowbrow, trashy magazine that actually sells more copies than uh, the Atlantic Monthly every year. But on uh, social media, the Atlantic Monthly is 45 times more popular <laughs> because everyone wants their friends to think they're really, really intellectual, right? Uh, and then it actually is interesting if you compare the, uh, the social media uh, posts and Google search posts, uh, Google searches. It's, uh, so if you look at the, the top ways people describe their husband on social media, the top five descriptors my husband is, uh, it's my husband is amazing, so cute, awesome, the best, and my best friend, uh, which is probably a misleading view of marriage, uh, to some degree at least. And then if you do Google, the top five completes of my husband is on Google, which is also kind of like a weird search to make, but people do make my husband is. Uh, one of them is also awesome, so that checks out. Uh, but the other ones are gay, a jerk, mean, and annoying. Uh, so it, it's really, uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I think you get, I'm not sure how, if one of them's right or wrong on marriage, uh, although I, but uh, it's definitely very different because on one you're trying to impress your friends and on one you're not. Thank you very much, very interesting. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, looking at that map, is there a way to tell, or do you tell the difference between two regions where like, there are like one where there's a lot of people doing those, for example, racist searches, or another area where it's like fewer people doing a lot of searches per person. Like, do you account for multiple searches per person? Uh, 
No, yeah, no, it's a good question. No, I, 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 that data is just not made available. Uh, I don't know if anyone at Google has it, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not made available except what Google does in, the, in Google Trends is they take out, if someone makes a lot of searches in a short period of time, it just counts as one search. So it's not like uh, someone just you know, in, a, in a half hour search this thing over and over again and that's driving the results. I think it is, it is an interesting comparison. I think it, in some ways it's an advantage of this data relative to surveys. Because I think surveys that we usually think of, not always, but we usually think of as yes or no, as binary. Either you are racist or you aren't racist. Uh, but there clearly are degrees of it, right? You're more, you're more or less likely. Uh, you, so, so in some sense, it's an advantage that includes people who've done it a lot of times because they're probably even more, uh, even more racist. So, uh, yeah. Cool. OK. I just have a few more. Thank you, everybody. Um, those were great questions. So I know you spent a lot of time thinking about naming your book and went through a bunch of sort of different names. Can you talk a little bit about the process of naming a book and how you came to Everybody Lies? Uh, well, so yeah, so that's why I initially brought up the, that ridiculous question that men asked, uh, because that's what I wanted to call my book. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted to call it How Big Is My Penis, What Google that's Searches. That's where I was going yeah, with that. <laughs> what, what Google Searches Reveal About Human Nature. But then uh, my publisher's like, people would be embarrassed to buy that at an airport. Uh, so I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't title it that. But uh, I think, uh, although I still kind of think that was a better title. Uh, although I do like this. This title I didn't think of. That was this was the, they came up with this title, and uh, I think it's good. I, I like know. it. Yeah, I like it. I think it gets to gets to a lot of the point. What about some of the other data sources you look at? I mean, obviously, you look at Facebook, you look at Pornhub, you look at you know a variety of different sources. How do those rank compare to, to Google? And uh, are you planning on looking more at other sources? Or is Google, for you, sort of the ultimate place to be? I think Google's just way better than all the other ones because uh, the honesty. And then it just kind of, it's so universal. A lot of these data sources, Twitter, like who uses Twitter? It's a very selected sample, but pretty much everybody uses Google. Uh, and then just any topic, there's information there. Like it can be a music or race or uh, sexuality or you know any, any, anything. There's probably at least some insights. Uh, Whereas in, Pornhub is pretty specific. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and like you know, or like they're kind of more one-offs. You can find something interesting uh, in the in the in the data set, but it's not. Uh, as comprehensive. With Google, you can find something interesting on any topic, I think. So it's more of a, I think it's a, 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 more, a, a more, like, orders of magnitude better than the other uh, data sources. We, we like to hear that. That keeps us in business. So um, what you, you, you mentioned before that you kind of have a grandiose, I actually think it's, it's um, a really sort of enlightening um, kind of sense of where data science is going for both philosophy, medicine, sort of how it can be used to really help people in the future. And so I was sort of wondering if you had any advice. I know we have a lot of data scientists out there, both at Google and in the world. What advice would you give them in terms of data science, what they should be doing, and where it's going? I think it's, I, I, well, I, kinda, I just think it's a really, really exciting area because uh, just because of all this new data, uh, that's out there that, uh, you know, I think like the insights that are coming uh, are going to be huge. I would say that some of the, that, uh, obviously, if people work at Google, part of their job is probably going to be a lot of, a, a decent percentage of, of Google employees uh, have to get people to click on ads, which is not necessarily the most uh, interesting, uh, in my opinion, uh, use of data, but uh, is important for Google's business. But like, I definitely think, I definitely think the health stuff is, uh, is really valuable. There's a, there was a study. How much time do we? Are we You're fine. Okay. Go ahead. So, uh, so there was this study uh, that uh, was done by Microsoft researchers in collaboration with a professor at Columbia. And they uh, studied uh, pancreatic cancer. I talk about it in the book. They studied pancreatic cancer. And they basically could figure out that they, they, it was, they studied individuals, was, uh, anonymized, de-identified individuals, their search behavior over time. And they said that, and they could guess based on someone's searches that they maybe got a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer because people type something like just diagnosed with pancreatic cancer what do i do or uh, like very very clear searches that they had pancreatic cancer and then what they did is they compared uh, these people to another group of users who were similar and never had such a diagnosis and then they looked at the searches 
in the months leading up to that diagnosis, so the symptoms that people were searching. And they said, what symptoms do people search that tells us in two or three months they're going to have a diagnosis of pancreatic cancer? And the key to the, the reason this study is potentially powerful is if you get the earlier you get a pancreatic cancer diagnosis, the, the higher your chances of survival. So, I uh, so they and they they using this data they found really subtle patterns to the point that if you search for indigestion before abdominal pain, that's a risk factor for pancreatic cancer. Whereas if you search just indigestion alone, that's not a risk factor for pancreatic cancer. So they had so much data they could pick up these really subtle patterns. I'm kind of scared. Whenever I hear this story, it's like whenever I, right after I read that paper, I thought I thought I had indigestion followed by abdominal pain. That's going to be in the anxiety book. Yeah. So I don't want everyone to go home and be like, ah, oh, crap, I, I got pancreatic cancer. But uh, I think I think that's like a really impressive way to do medicine relative to what we usually do. That, that's a pattern that uh, I talk to the researchers. Doctors don't know that series of symptoms. Like if you know, think how, the way that doctors now diagnose diseases, it's not as sophisticated as like a time series of people's symptoms over time and a huge sample to pick up patterns like that. So like, so I'm kind of, a lot of people after that said, uh, so what are the ethical implications? Should a search company, like if they know this information, should they tell you, you know, right below your button, I feel lucky you have pancreatic <laughs> cancer <laughs> or you might have pancreatic cancer, like that's kind of a depressing yeah. uh, thing to see on a search engine. But I think. So I think that they, they should, but they also, but that you should be able to opt into it. To say if I if I'm the type that wants information, like you should be able to say, hey, like if you can mine these patterns and potentially if I have some series of symptoms that tell me that I'm at a risk of a disease, and if I have am told that, I'll increase my odds. I want to be told that. Sure. But I go even further. I think that these businesses now have an obligation to be researching this to potentially find patterns of symptoms because I'm kind of pissed that there may be diseases that just because not enough data scientists uh, at, the, at these companies are looking into it, they may be able to pick, they may be picking up patterns in my symptoms uh, that could potentially save my life. So I think that like, I go even like, more extreme and, and think that there's an ethical obligation of companies to, who have this data to be really figuring out the health, uh, the, the, health, the health stuff there. So big implications. And with that, uh, let's give Seth a Round of applause for being here. Thank you.